Welcome to SCOTUS Cast, Federal Tort Claims Act and Individual Liability Edition. Thank you for tuning in. On June 6, 2016, the Supreme Court decided Simmons v. Himmelreich. This case arose out of lawsuits filed by federal prisoner Walter Himmelreich after he was assaulted by a fellow prisoner. Himmelreich's initial lawsuit, filed against the United States, was ultimately dismissed pursuant to an exception under the Federal Tort Claims Act for certain discretionary actions by prison officials. While that suit was still pending, however, Himmelreich filed a second suit, a constitutional tort action against individual Bureau of Prison employees. When Himmelreich's initial suit was dismissed, these employee defendants argued that his action against them was foreclosed by the FTCA's judgment bar provision, under which a judgment in an FTCA suit foreclosures any future suit against individual employees. The district court granted summary judgment in favor of the employees, On appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit reversed, holding that the judgment bar provision did not apply to Himmelreich's suit. The Supreme Court then granted certiorari to resolve a circuit split on whether the judgment bar provision applies to suits that, like Himmelreich's, are dismissed as falling within an exception to the FTCA. By a vote of 8-0, the Supreme Court affirmed the judgment of the Sixth Circuit and remanded the case. Justice Sotomayor delivered the opinion for a unanimous court, holding that the FTCA's judgment bar provision does not apply to claims dismissed because they fall within an FTCA exception. To discuss the case, we have Aaron Nielsen, who is Associate Professor of Law at Brigham Young University Law School. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And now, Professor Nielsen. Well, this should be a pretty quick podcast. The key takeaway is that just because an opinion is unanimous does not mean it isn't hard. There is a tricky issue in this case. The court was able to get around it, but the result is somewhat unsatisfying. Even so, at the end of the day, this is a reasonable opinion. So to reiterate the story, Walter Himmelreich, the respondent, is an inmate in federal prison. He alleges that he was assaulted by another prisoner. He also says that the petitioners, federal prison officials, were aware that the other inmate was going to attack him, but still they did not give him special protection. Respondents sued the United States. The United States is protected by sovereign immunity unless it waives it. One of the most important waivers of sovereign immunity is the Federal Tort Claims Act, or FTCA. Under the FTCA, respondents sued the United States. Later, however, respondents also sued the federal officials in their individual capacities under what is called a Bivens action. The district court dismissed respondents' claim against the United States as barred by sovereign immunity on the theory that the FTCA did not waive immunity for the discretionary acts alleged here. That dismissal matters because another federal law, known as the Judgment Bar, provides that, and I quote, The judgment in an action under Section 1346B of this title, i.e. the FTCA, shall constitute a complete bar to any action by the claimant by reason of the same subject matter against the employee of the government whose act or omission gave rise to the claim. Based on this complete bar language, respondents' claims against individual officers might also be barred. After all, as I explained in the pre-opinion podcast, A dismissal under the discretionary function exception is a judgment, and respondent's suit concerns the same subject matter as the suit against the United States, so the suit against the federal employees is also subject to a, quote, complete bar, end quote. At the Supreme Court, both sides had textual arguments. Petitioners pointed to the argument I just laid out, but respondent observes that another section of the statute provides that, again, I quote, The provisions of this chapter in Section 1346B of this title, which again is the FTCA, shall not apply to, end quote, over a dozen things, including arguably the judgment bar. This is the exceptions section of the FTCA. Respondent argues that due to the exceptions section, the judgment bar, quote, shall not apply, end quote, here. As I explained in the last podcast, At this point, I wish I had a whiteboard to show the text of the two statutes. The United States points to the judgment bar's text, which, read most naturally, seems to capture respondents' claims against the individual officers. But respondent points to Section 2680, which I just read, 
which also read most naturally, suggests the judgment bar shall not apply. Finally, and this is crucially important, is you have to know about a case called United States v. Smith, in which the Supreme Court held that one provision, arguably textually akin to the judgment bar, i.e., one of the others in one of the others mentioned in the exceptions section, is not covered by the exceptions. So there you go. As I explained before, a great deal of the briefing was dedicated to answering whether Smith is applicable here or whether it can be distinguished. If Smith applies, then respondent's argument would be sunk. Otherwise, he would have a clean textual argument. At oral argument, the justices struggled with Smith. Indeed, Justice Kennedy observed that to, quote, get around Smith, end quote, may be, quote, awkward, end quote. So what did the court end up doing? In an unanimous opinion authored by Justice Sotomayor, it got around Smith. Although acknowledging the government's position has some force, the court explained that Smith, for one thing, does not even mention the exception section. It also noted that the exception at issue in Smith, although part of the same text as the potential exception at issue here, had its own statutory history. The court, however, did not categorically hold that everything in the exception section should be treated like the judgment bar. Instead, it said it would, it would wait and see whether any particular section should be treated like the judgment bar or instead like the exception at issue in Smith. So in one sense, this result is a good one. It seems pretty faithful to the text of the statute. In another sense, however, it may be problematic. The result is in some tension with Smith. Sure, the court could distinguish Smith, but it wasn't seamless. For instance, the fact that Smith did not mention the exceptions sections um, shall not apply language only suggests that Smith may have been wrongly decided. It does not mean that Smith does not hold what it says. Likewise, the fact that the court is not willing to treat all the exceptions in the exception section the same means that there will likely be more litigation in the future. All that said, the court did not have a perfect solution here. It had precedent on one hand and plain text on the other. It went with the plain text, at least in this case. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. For more episodes of SCOTUScast, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.federalistsociety.org slash multimedia.